Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.ise.com slash podcasts. Um, the goal, at least the stated goal, was that if Spain borrows at these low rates here because of their membership in the Euro Club, as opposed to having to borrow at 500 basis points higher, all this money is going to allow Spain time to make their their markets more efficient, make their labor market more efficient, make their productivity more efficient. But in fact, um, that didn't happen. There was a big spending spree, uh, a lot of houses built. Uh, the labor productivity differences between Germany and Spain widened more and more and more. Germany uh, becoming relatively more efficient um, in productivity and labor um, as the years passed. So the goal of allowing these countries to borrow at these low rates and build up their economies to make them more competitive against Germany um, failed miserably. Um, but it wasn't a bad thing for Germany because all of this money that these countries borrowed um, went into consumption, as I said, and the consumption was primarily of German industrial goods. So it worked out it was a pretty good deal for Germany, even though they were the paymaster along the way, still supporting the sub major subsidizer of this system. Then we had this little thing called the credit crunch, and this is that bump uh, that Friedman talked about. Um, and this is when we started really getting busy about, <clears throat> about the idea that, hey, this was really going to be a hit um, to the euro, and we didn't think it was going to hold up. Um, and you can see how the spread started to widen. The market finally started to price in some risk in these euro member bonds relative to Germany. Now, back in here, this risk should have been the same. They should have, risk should have been priced in. But they started pricing in the risk finally with the credit crunch. That was the first sign that the European monetary system was, was a little bit in trouble when the spread started to widen. Um, it said the market's waking the idea that the system isn't as solid as everybody thinks it is. And as I said earlier, we don't think the, the full risk is even premiums are priced in because if we go back to where they were before the euro, um, started where Spain was, you know, we're looking at 500 basis points. Now we're approaching 200 basis point differences in these yields, and everybody's in panic mode. So the point is this can go much higher if we go back to, to where we were. Um, so I think this one chart really says it all, and you'll, you'd see a similar chart if you lined up um, Greece on here or Portugal or whatever. You'd see a similar type of thing, very high yields relative to to Germany, once they entered the euro, the yields automatically shrank incredibly. Uh, they borrowed and went on a big spending spree, um, and everybody was fat, dumb, and happy um, until the credit crunch. Germany is the glue, as we said. They really are holding this whole system together. So if Germany shrugs, uh, it's game over. It really, it, it's really that simple. Um, France pretends that they're controlling this and calling all the shots. Um, France screams the loudest. Um, Sarkozy has a way of doing that. Um, but Germany is really the key. They're the wealth producer. Um, and, French, and France's fiscal situation is, has worsened a lot of late also. Again, much better relative to these basket case countries, but, but worse than Germany. And they have some of their own concerns. But again, um, uh, France is, is big believers in the euro because, um, and Germany obviously through Merkel is too. One of the primary goals of the of, of the monetary union, and, and this is where we tell we we have written about this um, a lot. And people, when we say it, people just just look at us and go, "What are you What are you talking about?" Well, we think we, we're standing up and cheering and hoping the euro fails as a currency. And the reason we say that is not because we want pain spread across uh, people of Europe. That's, that's, not, that's not our reasoning at all. We're small government type people. Um, we don't like socialism. And the whole European Monetary Union was, was part of this idea to centralize power in Brussels um, and, and really have more political, con political control over everybody. That was part of the reasoning behind this. So when we see something like that fail, we're very, very happy. Um, the other goal, of course, as I said, was to allow Germany its captive market for exports. They export about 50% of their stuff um, to the Eurozone economies. So that's why they were willing, as I said, to give up the DMARC and prov provide the sub subsidies for the system uh, to survive. Um, but you can imagine now with all the austerity in place, 
um, and all the consumption that's going to disappear if they actually put all these austerity measures in place in Spain, in Greece, in Portugal. Ireland's already done it in a big way. And we see it in a lot of the in the Baltic countries. We're seeing the austerity, you know, crush GDP. It really hurt people. It means that the demand for German goods, these captive exports that were so easy before, are going away. So if you're Germany, you're looking at this and you're saying, um, number one, I'm supposed to keep subsidize everybody here and then get yelled at by France for doing it. Um, uh, number two, um, my taxpayers. Um, are screaming at me, and I'm taking political pressure. Um, and three, the reasoning behind this is to pump up German industry all of a sudden isn't getting the benefits of this. What's the point? And that's the reason I say you're seeing more and more of the of the incentives um, fall off the table for Germany, and disincentives are starting to rise on the, from the political side of the fence, which is, as we know, um, quite powerful for politicians. The only thing they know is sometimes the ballot box. So it's a precarious situation. Germany has said going forward that, hey, we are going to, if we're going to give money to you guys, we want a clear and distinct accounting of where this money is going and making sure your budget deficits are in order, um, you know, on a quarterly basis. Um, there's a big, big fight going on already over that because some of the other players in the Euros officials of the Eurozone are saying, Germany, um, it's ridiculous to think that they can have that type of control. Well, Germany makes the point. If we give up the money, we should have the control. Um, so there's a battle going on there uh, underneath the surface that's trying to be soothed over at the moment. moment. The funny thing is, though, um, as Germany clamps down more and more in these countries to, be, to, to provide more and more fiscal austerity, it hurts their exports. It hurts demand for the entire Eurozone. Um, there's a parallel that uh, kind of for this, and it was the 1929, when things got in trouble in 1929, we saw a similar, uh, obviously, shakeout in the global <clears throat> community. But then we also saw by 1931, as things started to rebound a bit, um, the countries in Europe started to cr do the same type of thing, um, cramp, cramp down um, and, and, and really... Um, put a level of austerity over the zone to try and solve these problems, and then it, it spiraled down even more, and then we had many, many years of, of depression. Um, it's a, so that's, that's the risk here, that even if austerity measures succeed, they ultimately um, create um, as much or more pain going forward, and I'll get to the reasoning for that in just a second. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.